Well, I want to, first of all, welcome everybody, new friends as well as old ones, young ones as well as old ones. Uh, welcome to our monthly Chicago area League of Revolutionaries for a New America web political conversation. We present these on the last Saturday of the month and the topics and formats vary. This is going to be a new one for us today. Uh, and today, as our government assures us that we're putting the pandemic behind us, we survey the world and the statistics are not very comforting. There are more than 600,000 dead in the United States. And if you look globally, the world total is almost three and a half million, about three and a half million. And this widely believed to be an undercount. The total could be twice as much. So while the news tries to fix the origin of the pandemic in a particular incident, like the, <clears throat> the laboratory uh, accident or transmission from animal to human, we're going to look at it in a different way. We're going to take a much larger context in this presentation. We're going to look at how the, how the environment created what, uh, what allows such a, a massive outbreak. And even more, while the pandemic has laid bare the inequities in society and globally, we're going to ask, how is white supremacy fundamental to contemporary politics? These are questions we hope to explore and a lot more. So my task is really very simple. My task here is to introduce you to the two co-moderators of this program, Dr. Maria J. Estrada, Hisu, and Tristan Henry who will lead you through the program. So Brilliant. I'm going to ask you to take it away. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be quick because we have an exciting new thing that we're doing. So my name is Jesus Estrada. I am a proud member of Chicago, the League of Revolutionaries for New America chapter. I am an educator by trade. I teach at Harold Washington College. And I also run the chapter chair of my union. And I run what I have found out is a hobby. Um, a charity press. So that is who I am. And Tristan, who has better headphones than I am, you want to introduce yourself? My name is Tristan Henry. Um, I have connected with the LRNA as, a, as an associate, and I, I am a lover of people. Um, my trade is actually in the medical field. I work as a medical technologist, so it's um, not as rewarding as a lot of the uh, wonderful people in this group who are helping to shape the minds of either young or old or helping communities and stuff. So I definitely want to be a lot more involved. And this definitely gives me that opportunity. So we're happy to have each and every one of you guys here today with us. And that was an amazing league pitch. Let's just do that one, Lou. You just put in a CD, <laughs> videotape it, send that out to the universe. So yes. I am very proud to introduce, uh, before we get into the actual program, we have uh, my yoga teacher, Donna Babs, and uh, Donna Babs can see a little bit about, more about herself, but we thought we could do some meditation and creative flow because we're going to be hitting on some heavy topics. Well, I might as well just explain the program now. Um, but, uh, and then after the speakers go, then we're gonna take a poetry break and somebody who's kind of talented is gonna read. <laughs> and then we're gonna put you in breakout rooms, I think, and then have you discuss these topics at hand. So when we come back, we'll have a more fruitful discussion. So we'll go over that again. I probably muddled it a little bit. Again, it's a new format. And so I hope you guys enjoy it. Woo, Jack Hirschman in the house, everybody. Mm -hmm. So Donna, please take it away for us. Well, hello, everyone, and good afternoon. And yes, as Jesus said, this can be some heavy topics or topics that really get you your heart racing because you care about it. We, we do things and we get uh, wound up because we, we care. And in order to sort of uh, make sure that we can think clearly and move forward, uh, let's just take a few moments to sort of ground ourselves and center ourselves. So sitting comfortably, but not so comfortably that you're like, Ugh, so sort of an alert, comfortable. Let your shoulders sort of maybe move back a little bit and relax down. We tend to hunch forward and this helps us to open up a little bit. Let your feet be flat on the ground and just sort of feel where you're at in space, how your body feels. 
And maybe just, you know, if you want to put a hand sort of on your chest to sort of monitor your heart and your breath. And you can have your eyes open or closed, whatever feels, you know, better to you. But just grounding yourself in the here and now and letting yourself know, like, I'm safe right here. So that whenever anything, you know, it starts to get you going too much and you need to sort of pull back a little bit, feel your feet on the ground. So feel through the soles of your feet, feel that grounding, that connection. Maybe right now, press your right foot down into the ground a little bit and just notice how that changes your body, how your leg may engage a little bit. You may feel it in your hips. You may feel it somewhere up above and then release it down and let it relax. Maybe one more time with the right foot, just pressing, noticing that change through the body and relax. And then the left foot, press it down. Feel the sensations in your body and relax. And one more and relax. And then just noticing your breath, we're just gonna take our hand off of our heart for a moment and clench it. Clench it as tight as you can and take a deep breath. And really notice your breath and how it's moving. Try it one more time, breathe really deep and relax. And then let the hand go, let it relax, let it rest on your table or in your lap. And now take a deep breath. And release. And just notice the difference between that. So if you are clenched up in any place, and even if it's a thought, sometimes, you know, like even if we're just holding on to a thought, it can be harder to breathe deeply. So just remembering that. And when you get too tense, too tight, too worked up, take a breath. Let yourself, let your body relax out, feel your feet on your floor. Feel your bottom in your seat. Feel your shoulders relax down. Maybe take your hand to your heart and just breathe for a moment. And notice, is it hard? Is it tight? Is it shallow? And if so, try to release a little bit. Try to relax and let your brain flow a little bit more. Let yourself think a little bit more putting yourself into that more reflexive state to sort of acknowledge what's being said, acknowledge what is, and then being able to work towards what you want things to be. Deep inhale, long, slow exhale. And then it's the other thing, we get into that fight or flight. Fight or flight can be shallow. It could be a lot of inhale and not so much exhale and to sort of get yourself a little bit of relief, lengthen those exhales, and then come back to what you're doing. So I invite you just to think about that as you're going forward and listening to this, trying to be open, receptive, and at peace. <laughs> that was amazing. I have to say my headache's going away. <laughs> beautiful beautiful so part of the reason we brought donna is that i don't remember if it was this session or another we've been talking a lot about self-care so i think it's important that as revolutionaries as activists we keep that in mind and, and yoga is just one of those ways so i invited donna um to just put her links to her um to her online yoga classes and her face-to-face -face class it's very very beautiful wonderful worth the coin very much worth the coin okay so it is our honor and privilege to introduce two wonderful comrades. And so I think I'm going to have them do this themselves. But Joyce Mills is a retired nurse from Oakland. And Patrick is a super amazing activist and musician here from Chicago. And they're both going to introduce themselves and blow your mind away with this fantastic presentation. Just let me make sure you all can share. Um, and then you guys will be set. Oops, I don't want to share that. Let me see if you can share your, your PowerPoint. But Joyce, if you okay. want to go ahead and take it away. OK, yes. Um, wow, thanks so much, Donna, because you know one thing that's so clear is what um, 
as Sue was saying, you know, we're really, uh, we're really dealing with a lot of mental health issues right now. I'm sure all of us in our families have had that and people, yeah, people are even, you know, leaving in droves, whether we're teachers or nurses or whatever, you know, the quote unquote essential workers are, are getting burnt out. So, um, you know, revolutionaries have to, have to keep ourselves about ourselves. So, um, yeah, I'm, I wanted to, um, of course, um, Patrick, my, my colleague is going to take us more deeply into um, these concepts. But I wanted to just introduce, I guess I was asked to just introduce some things about the pandemic and the future of humanity, the questions of the relationship of COVID uh, to the embeddedness of white supremacy in our uh, state and, and uh, country and the ecological crisis underlying it all. So let me just try and do what Let's see, um, slide show, is that on there for everybody? No, Han, you have to share screen. So you see that green button That's in the middle? That's what I gotta do, hold on right. a second. And then I'm make sure sorry. if you're, it doesn't have sound in it or no sound? No sound, it's okay. me talking. Okay. Beautiful. Um, and if you have any tech issues, I'd be happy to show it if you need me to, but No, yeah. you're, you're absolutely okay. right. Uh, let's see, share sure. screen. We can breathe. Ah. <laughs> so um, what about that? That's beautiful. Looks okay. great. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm opening just with a picture from um, the gateway in India. This is a picture that was spliced from before COVID on the left to after those early days um, when the world was forced to pause for a short time. Um, and I think we experienced this all over the world. There's pictures for all over the world of just people um, recognizing that even a short pause in our um, way of living produced already just the, the, the tendency for the earth to try and heal and give us a little bit more a sense of, of what we could have. Um, I was reading something um, just from Arundhati Roy and she said, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one's no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, or dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through lately with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and fight for it. And I just thought that was a good sort of sense of what I think I'm trying to do in this, which is not just present the horrors, but also the opportunity that we have in this moment. Um, and just quickly, 340 African feminists said this, this crisis is an opportunity to dislodge inequality and reframe the political economy which contributed to the tipping point. So um, what if, these little benefits that we saw that are already pretty well gone, I guess, you know, and most as, as, as quote unquote reopen, you know, what if we could begin to um, conceive of a way for that to continue uh, post pandemic, which of course post pandemic is not anywhere near where we are right now. Um, the, you know, people have, estimated you know what that might be like there's all kinds of data on this and lovely maps and so forth um but i think the underlying thing that people are recognizing on a broader scale than ever before is that we are we are living in a model that just doesn't work anymore so whatever your search is for an answer to where we go next I think that's something that is in common 
with all of us. Um, and it's the pandemic has just exposed this whole idea that we can't have health care except for if we have a job and an income, uh, which is particularly true in this country, given that we don't have uh, even universal access to insurance, never mind to real doctors and health care. Um, the sort of framing of what I wanted to introduce here was the relationship of two kind of big framing elements. One is that we're undergoing a leap in humanity that we were undergoing before the pandemic, which is a leap in the way that we produce things, which, and not because we have decided to, but because of the historical development that capitalism and private property systems have gotten themselves into, which is this labor use of technology instead of to expand our world and our connections as a labor replacing technology that has thrown out and ended the kind of world that our parents and grandparents and great grandparents knew, whether they were working in, in, in uh, one way or another for wages or were uh, enslaved, that we're really not seeing um, any kind of relationship to um, the old world. And that was coming into the, the uh, pandemic. The same thing was true of the rift that uh, my colleague Patrick is gonna talk a lot more about, this rift in the ecology which capitalism has gotten us to between humankind and nature or between humankind and ourselves and nature. And I just wanted to point out that there's a couple of, you know, th there's so many instances, there's so many, um, quotes and, and so forth, but there, the reality of it is that these, um, the underlying premise that I think we have to look at with COVID-19 is that the cause is not just these pathogens that we've um, been in touch with and that have taken off. We really are looking at an entire ecosystemic set of relations in capital and structural changes um, that that uh, was spoken to in this lovely piece, uh, 19 uh, COVID-19 in the circuits of capital, um, which we'd be glad to send you if you haven't read it. The kinds of things that people are looking at, this is from a, um, a report by Oxfam that was just done. They're just estimating right now how many people would have been alive, um, you know, if things had been quote unquote more equal in terms of how people's reality had uh, interacted with uh, the social uh, situation in our countries. And people are beginning to talk about this as a question of social death or social murder, which is an older concept, um, you know, that Marx developed, um, you know, many years ago. Um, but the the thing that I think we want to sort of, and it, I know this is my my voice is tightening up, like probably I should be thinking how to breathe better, but that. It's not just a natural incident. Not only is it that the, the um, contact is from our expansion on the earth, but even once COVID hit, this is a largely socially caused problem. And I think people are beginning to really get a handle on this. Um, the, uh, it's not, it's not just revolutionaries who are noticing this. Um, there are about 100,000 deaths that, that, this is the Deborah Burks, this is from the White House person um, that, that came with the original surge and all of the rest of them could have been mitigated or decreased. I mean, 
this is an understatement, um, this 40% of COVID deaths preventable. And it's increasing, of course, in um, this is not just in the United States. Um, and I wanted to read this little short piece. I'm sorry, uh, let me go back uh, quickly. This is a little piece from Engels and the condition of working class in England. This is 1845. When society places hundreds of proletarians in a position that they inevitably meet too, a too early and an unnatural death, one which is quite as much a death by violence as that by the sword or bullet, when it deprives thousands of the necessities of life and places them under conditions in which they cannot live and forces them through the strong arm of the law to remain in such conditions until death ensues, its deed is murder, just as surely as the deed of a single individual disguised malicious murder. Oops, going forward. So um, I wanted to get to this question of white supremacy in this in in, in a particular way in this uh, presentation, which is its embeddedness in the entire structure, not only of our healthcare system and our policing system and our judicial system, but in the very way in which our entire state, nation state has been constructed. And this question comes up in the COVID crisis, very particularly in looking at the history of the, uh, the old slave South and how that process of um, guaranteeing, for instance, every time we fought for universal health care in this country, that we cannot have it. We can't have a universal system because the uh, history of the Southern control over labor and over humanity dictates that you can't have it in other parts of the country if you're going to you're going to rely on having it in the south and so i just put some statistics actually we've written a recent article in the rally comrades which is the paper that the league puts out um talking about this uh, uh very specifically in terms of the history of public health and medical care being so severed that we, we, we don't even think of public health as anything other than data collection and something that separates itself from the kind of mutual relations in a community. Um, it's always tr the government trying to get you to do something um, for, for the country or for the good of some kind of sense of nation. And this is, this is not, even natural, even under capitalism. This is a very unusual thing that the United States has, um, which has kept us from ever getting our hands on any kind of universal healthcare system. And if people remember, not only, and of course the effects are here, you know, the effects are that before the pandemic, Southerners had 30% plus preventable deaths, uh, the rural, hospital closures, the federally funded clinic, there's, there's, there's no healthcare uh, for most people. Um, that was pre-pandemic. And of course, nobody in, in the, even the current administration is seriously talking about uh, changing that situation. Um, and of course, I think um, what we're looking at is that it's not just about vaccines, although the vaccines are gonna show um, they're going to show a lot of about this reality, not just in terms of inequality, which of course is there, but in terms of just the the just the lack of system. I was a public health nurse for years. I think people don't even recognize that even in my lifetime, we have destroyed what was left of any kind of public health system, as patriarchal as it was, as paternalistic as it may have been, but that did include 
things like visiting people in their homes, things like guaranteeing that people um, had some access to help um, beyond simply one disease that they may have had or one condition that they may have had. Um, we just don't exist. I was a public health nurse. I did uh, work with homeless folks. I was one of the first homeless nurses. Um, and, you know, that it's gone. I mean, all there's there is a van now that goes around and, and talks to people, even in our progressive Oakland, Berkeley area. Um, and this idea of vaccine hesitancy, you know, I think, you know, there's lots of statistics coming out about this. And it's very true that people have historically, um, you know, been very hesitant to just get vaccinated or do something that the federal government uh, wants done. And But remember with Tuskegee, which is the thing that people mention most when it comes to African-American hesitancy, Tuskegee as a, as a horror situation didn't even get started as what it turned out to be. It, it turned into what it was gonna, it, what it turned out to be is this, this uh, forcing people to not get penicillin for, for their illness. But it started out because there was no healthcare in the South. And this was promoted as a way of giving at least some healthcare. I mean, it's, it's a deep, deep um, history that I think we need to go a lot uh, further into to understand why we can't get done what just seems so obviously uh, needs to be done. Um, the effects um, for us in the revolutionary process, I think, is something that I'm hoping we'll talk about more in this session. Um, we're really looking at revaluing, not only uh, people call it rehumanization, really not just the essential worker idea, which at least has given us a sense that there is essential work that needs to be done in society that can't just be done um, in, in, in some digital way, um, that, that we really do need actual carers in this society. Um, and that that's what's been taken out first in, in, the, in the whole process that we're involved in. There's calls all over for public health to declare a public health emergency around um, racism. There's all kinds of in indications that people are trying to find a way to um, address this. But in the end, this is a part of the most fundamental thing that we talked about earlier, this relationship of a rift between humanity and our nature self, this, the, the nature that we are a part of, and the leap in society that really is undoing the laws of capitalism itself, which is that you, you have to, the only way to make a system like capitalism work is by exploiting labor. And digital technology is being used to replace, um, replace us permanently from even that kind of exploitation. We can't live in this system anymore. And I think the um, current situation with what people are calling vaccine apartheid around the world um, really shows that this is a global, we're a global class, we're a global uh, set of people that are no longer can live in this system. And this idea that no one is safe until everyone's safe is not just a nice uh, term, it's actually the reality um, that, that, that we face. Um, and the, I wanna just end with two little thoughts about where we go from here. And one is there's a lot of discussion about governing us governing the question of democracy being of, by, and for the people, which of course our society has always wanted and thought of itself as being about, but which it is not. The idea that 
um, we are beginning to question private property itself, that pe the American people are beginning to see that we need some kind of public administration of things to guarantee life and guarantee health, but we do not need the control of people. We don't need the police. We don't need this kind of system that controls people rather than guaranteeing that goods get to us. And this is sort of the classic struggle that I think we've been coming up to. Again, our grandparents, our parents um, have been getting up to, which is what does this look like? What does a public administration of things in a modern society where we are connected globally, what does it look like? Not going back or pretending that we can, you know, uh, undo both the positive and negative aspects of what our social relations have uh, brought, but recognizing there has to be fundamental uh, change in how we uh, run our society. Um, and just to end, um, that what the coronavirus situation continues to reveal to us is that there's so many ideas that this is uh, Candace Mallet, the you know writer from Black Canary, uh, Teen uh, Vogue, that that so many ideas we were told were too radical have suddenly become practical as the pandemic continues to escalate. As we self-isolate for our collective survival, let's make sure we don't forget those who are unable to do so. And I think. Uh, that's a wonderful statement. And I think more what we're really saying is this idea that communism or a shared economy or a, a cooperative economy or a different kind of world based on us having a relation to one another is not something that we need to think about as some future goal, long range goal, while we just get a, you know, do the practical things to survive under capitalism. That really what's happened here is a shift where what's practical is the transformative economy and society that we need. We will not solve the problems that we have to uh, deal with, with this leap um, and with this rift without starting, it's really communism is a way to get to a new stage of human uh, relation. And that's really consistent with the way Marx even looked at it um, in this quote, that communism is the positive transcendence of private property as human self estrangement, and therefore as the real appropriation of the human essence and for humanity, by and for humanity, the complete return of humanity to itself as a social being, as fully developed naturalism, which equals humanism. It's the general resolution, ge genuine resolution of the conflict between humanity and nature and between ourselves. Thank you. Ooh, I was just giving you the two minute marker. Joyce, that was amazing. Uh, up next, we have our comrade Patrick, who is going to talk about um, the metabolic rift and his an amazing analysis. And uh, you got, there you go. Brilliant. Patrick, you there? Patricio. Hola. Yes. Hola, hola. hola. Yes, perfectly. Awesome. One sec. Thank you so much for that, uh, Joyce. Um, Alrighty, so I can't see anyone now. There you are, and I just want to see your beautiful faces. Um, yeah, thank you again, Joyce, for that um, run through with us. Um, basically, I am going to go uh, a little bit more into the relationship between capitalism and nature. Um, uh, yeah, um, using this concept of the metabolic rift and how as revolutionaries, um, it's important to us. Uh, a, a little bit about myself maybe, um, 
I'm Patrick, um, live in Chicago. I'm a revolutionary with Lerna. Um, I'm an agroecologist and urban farmer, permaculturist, um, organizer with the Chicago Union of the Homeless, um, and food sovereignty activist. Um, yeah, a um, little bit about my background. So, uh, what is the metabolic rift? Um, what we're talking about um, is basically the uh, the central theory out there, um, in my opinion, the governing set of ideas that outlines the inherent contradictions between capital accumulation and the reproduction of ecological processes. Or put simply, simpler, um, the contradiction, inherent contradiction between capitalism and nature. Um, it's a, a term coined by uh, Karl Marx and, and others. Um, so sorry, by the way, um, in a park I just got off work, so there's gonna be birds and cars and stuff around. Sorry in advance for that. Um, but yeah, um, the, the, the term, yeah, so the, the, the term we're using of, of metabolic rift is, goes back to the 1850s with Karl Marx. Um, from his studies of the uh, agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution that in a sense almost began with agriculture um, that he was witnessing uh, and um, his study of agricultural scientists, um, Justice von Liebig and, and lots of others, some who were critical of capitalism and some who embraced it. Um, so yeah, just to talk some more about all this um, is, you know, to go, to, to, to explain the metabolic rift, I think we have to start with, you know, what do we mean by metabolism? Um, and what, it's a metaphor from biology, obviously, but what it means is um, the, the basic um, interchange uh, relationship between humans and their environment. Uh, it, it, you could talk about um, any, any organism and their environment it has metabolism in that sense. Um, and in terms of human society, it's a universal and perpetual feature um, across all cultures and societies, right? Um, it's basically the process of appropriation. Um, humans interacting with their environment um, is, you know, what is called appropriation, um, which just means taking from the environment and through most of human history, um, appropriation what was happening um, cyclically, meaning um, non-linearly humans were taken from their environment and the waste products of that appropriation went back right back into the environment. And um, the product of appropriation can be thought of in general terms as just property. Now there's lots of different kinds of property and um, you know, in pre or post capitalist frameworks, we can think of you know, property, uh, the product of our metabolism as being collective or public, but through, um, in, you know, through specifically with capitalism, um, the the accumulation of capital, um, that property is made private through this process that uh, Marx and lots of others have called expropriation, which. Um, is a very key concept. And what expropriation is, is basically appropriation, taking from the environment without exchange or without reciprocity. Uh, basically just means theft. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a kind of exploitation and um, it's uh, in material senses, in, in, in a material sense, examples of expropriation are the enclosures, um, enslavement, um, exploitation, um, and um, yeah, uh, and, and it, it is the capitalist form of, of appropriation, it, it is expropriation. Um, and 
an, another example of expropriation basically is, is what we're, we're seeing now, um, ca uh, climate change, the climate crisis. Um, it's something that basically people were predicting, like people like Karl Marx and other scientists uh, at the dawn of the industrial revolution and capitalism, basically were predicting um, that uh, ca climate change being the uh, specific form of expropriation of non-atmospheric carbon, right? It's the process of taking carbon um, from deep in the earth and expelling the waste product lin linearly out into the atmosphere and all of the uh, consequences that result from that. And the global consequences that result, um, I, I think of it as the universalization, um, or the universalization, yeah, of the, of the metabolic rift. Metabolic rift, I, I like this little diagram here. Um, it's, it's a broken cycle, right? It's a linear process. Um, and this, this diagram just hits, hits at it in the sense of, um, you know, food production, uh, our food system, which relies on inputs to grow food, food that goes to people who eat it. The waste from that process, right, is expelled somewhere else and, and, and creates problems somewhere else. Um, this is a linear process. And, and this is the, the uh, initial observation that Marx and others were making at the dawn of, of capitalism was that instead of a, a agricultural populations, now all of a sudden we have rapid urbanization, rapid growth of, of urban populations. And um, uh, yeah, they, they are, are no longer a, a appropriating from the environment, or not them really, but the society as a whole is no longer appropriating, but we're expropriating. We're taking and, and not returning. Um, and I think it's, yeah, very important um, to look at expropriation and the metabolic rift as being, can be thought of re really as the external side of um, capitalism. And as I'm sure we all uh, are aware, capitalism has um, a basic fundamental need to exploit human labor. Um, and that is basically can be thought of as its internal process. Capitalism is by definition a system that uh, exploits human labor, but its external relation, it has an external process as well, which is the, its relationship to the natural world. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I just, you know, really a lot of people right now are pointing out that the, uh, destruction of nature and the destruction of human beings are two sides of the same coin that capitalism operates on. Right. Um, I forgot to include it in my slide. This is a quote from, uh, an article from the monthly review, um, the expropriation of nature by John Bellamy Foster. Um, side note, the monthly review, um, who's, it's actually edited by John Bellamy Foster, is, uh, has a wealth of, of different, you know, pieces on, on this topic. Um, someone else who, who was an early theorist in this regard uh, was James O'Connor. Um, and I, I like his analysis as well. He goes into basically a analysis of, of capitalism as that, like I was saying before, it has two contradictions. One, the, the um, in a sense, yes, it's, it's exploitation of human beings and also it's uh, reliance on profit to, to exist, profit being generated by exploitation. But the inevitable contradiction that results of the more you exploit people um, and, and, you know, the more that as the same time technology evolves, uh, the, the greater number of people are pushed out of the economy um, due to things like autom autom um, automation. And what you have is uh, products being produced through, through, through capital that no one can buy because they, they're too poor, right? Um, the overproduction. 
side of capitalism and what James O'Connor refers to as the underproduction basically of ecological processes. And these are the two contradictions of, 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 of capitalism. Um, and what he concludes and what I offer as well is that like before, um, you can't think of class struggle as being, you know, one or the other as being labor or being environmental. They're two sides of the same coin. And um, they have the same goal ultimately to abolish capital. And um, yeah, so synthesizing these two things, like I said, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. Um, what, one of my favorite reflections of this in the real world and um, as a natural development of class struggle is the Earth, Earth Day to May Day movement. Um, the eight days between Earth Day and May Day, May 1st, are uh, in, in, in recent years has become a gathering point of, um, of revolutionaries that understand this, that understand that environment, environmental and ecological struggles globally are intimately connected to the capitalists and corporations that are ruling our world and um, destroying our planet. And um, to defeat them, we have to, we, we need class solidarity, right? We need working class solidarity. Um, so there's, 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 and there's other, uh, and, and continues to be more manifestations of this, such as the Green New Deal, um, which is basically the same kind of uh, melding of, of struggles. Um, and, you know, you, we also must recognize, I think, the incredible work of uh, the Red Nation and the Red Deal. Um, they are comrades, uh, indigenous comrades who are proposing a, a decolonization framework towards the Green New Deal. That's that's extremely important um, because you know before Marx was talking about you know the, the metabolic rift, the indigenous people of the planet were were facing it and fighting it um, on real terms long before he was talking about it, and they are leading the struggle um, against it. I like this diagram um, showing kind of a restoration of the metabolic rift, um, one that uses use value and one, ones that, if, if we think about human society that, that exists on a restored relationship with our metabolism with the rest of the world, um, it starts to just look more like every other ecosystem we, we see, right? Um, it, there's no abstraction of exchange value and monetary value and finance, it's, it's use value, right? Um, and, and there are concrete, I think, examples of this out there. Um, one that I've studied closely is, and that I encourage others to check out, are the uh, agroecological, revolutionary agroecological developments of Cuba um, since the special period at the dawn of the 1990s when the Soviet Union collapsed, Cuba had to rapidly um, shift to an, to uh, organic agriculture, um, and because they had a socialist project, they were able to rapidly democratize their food, democratize and build their food system up from scratch. Um, and the work there is incredibly exemplary of what we all need to be uh, working on. I think. Um, talking about worker ownership, right? The law of return and the, the, the resolution of the town country divide, um, use value and biodiversity restored and private property abolished. Um, can I get a heart emoji for that? <laughs> um, and in, in conclusion, um, you know, we're not just obviously we're not just armchair armchair revolutionaries talking about this. We have to look at, um, we have to be engaged in the re real world struggles. So this is something happening in a, in a week or two um, that I'm participating in. 
This is a treaty people gathering in northern Minnesota, um, a massive uh, resistance movement that's happening soon to stop line three, a pipeline, tar sands pipeline coming from Canada and going through uh, northern Minnesota. And um, yeah, I'm sure people are aware of it, but just to put this on your radar. And uh, that's about all I have. I, I think we're gonna take a break now and hear some poetry and then we're gonna have some discussion questions in breakout rooms. If that's yeah, stop, stop taking my job, bro. <laughs> yes, that's exactly no. right. Uh, no, I love you. That was amazing. And just so you have some time to process, um, hermano, could you stop sharing and, and I will love you forever. Okay, thank you, my friend. Otherwise I'll get confused. Okay, so I am going to do a, what day is it? Saturday miracle. So I uh, also got to thank my comrade, Matt Cedillo for coaching me because it's been a goal to memorize a piece. I'm trying my best. But um, this is in context. Well, let me give you more context. Um, when I was growing up, I grew up in the Southwest uh, outside the desert between Yuma and Summerton, Arizona. And I'm 49 years old, <laughs> I'm 49. So when I grew up, uh, there was no education about how to teach bilingual students. They just separated them from the classroom. And we were publicly shamed for speaking Spanish. We couldn't speak Spanish in the classroom. If we cursed, we got paddled. You know, so it was it was a really difficult time because I was a kid and as an immigrant child, my parents taught me to respect teachers and don't question teachers. I couldn't talk to them. So we used to have this big old picture of Jesus in the living room, you know, the very European blue eyed. And I was five years old and then I came home and I remember like I just cussed him out at the top of my lungs. And for a long time, I carried this guilt because I was like, shit, I'm going to hell now, you know, but then I've come to realize that Jesus is a revolutionary. So yeah, so we're like this, okay? So that's how I think of the Lord. Um, so so this is called Jesucristo Santificanos. I'm gonna cheat. I put, I put my, little, my little crutch. And uh, it also speaks to um, my grandmother who uh, I was saying in another talk that my dad made me a poet, but my mother gave me the heart of a revolutionary. And my grandmother, God bless her soul, um, she also is a reason I learned to love everybody. Just love the whole world. So, okay. But this is a downer, so. <laughs> so this causes it's a gris of I can hear the eternal mumbling of El Rosario in the other room. And I am alone in the living room with dirty blue walls. More alone than my first day of school where I looked at a woman I didn't understand because she was a gringa and I am a wetback child. And I hated her and her sick colored skin. I hated all those kids who didn't know what I was saying, hated how they stood up, put their hands over the hearts. They looked at the cloth with bright red and blue and moved on and on like my abuelita when she runs all the words together from El Rosario. The gringa's eyes are full and new, not like your eyes that are dying colors and you you didn't help me. And now you're looking at me with those dumb blue eyes like all those kids who didn't know when I said hello. You know everything and they didn't know nothing. No me mires con esos pinches ojos. Cause you're looking at me like I'm no good. Cause you know my dad's a mojado. And I can mumble the way they do when they stand so tall to pray. All right, so there you have it. The miracle has happened. I did not have to cheat. That was again a Jesucristo Santificano. So thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mesa Dio. All right, so this is how the breakout rooms are going to roll out. Uh, we're going, we have six, so that's five per, or person who keeps hopping in and out. I'm gonna wait a little bit out here. You're gonna go into the breakout rooms. Thank you. You can talk about anything you want, but we did have some guiding questions that we're also gonna ask our speakers. And then um, we'll see where we're at. Okay. And so my co-moderator, Tristan, the yeah. magnificent, go ahead and read those questions. Do you want me to share them so you can see them or you got them? Uh, I got them right here. So we got for the breakout room uh, questions. Question number one was, why does COVID apartheid exist? Uh, number two, why is the environment being destroyed? Number three is, what is the intersectionality among these events? Uh, for example, how do these issues interrelate? And lastly, how can we unite our various movements so we strengthen each other into victory? Yeah, yeah. So 
you have the option of choosing where you want to go. Um, but if not, I can assign you. And then there are six rooms. So that's how many do math. That's about three to four people per room. So do you want me to just put you with random folks? You'll have 20 minutes to talk about the questions, hopefully come up with new knowledge, or do you want to choose your room? It's up to y'all. Me choose? All right. Choose. Okay, sounds good. Could you, give, could you give us those in the chat, the questions? Girl, I passed them out like 20 times, but I'm going to pass them out to get into the breakout rooms. Never no, mind. it's okay. Okay, I think uh, this looks pretty good. And then, yeah. hold up, let me see. I can do this. Okay, this is good. Sorry, I'm, I can't multitask and I have to talk to myself or it's complete, like mess it up. Uh, uh, okay, I'll put you guys, gals and others in the group. And then um, uh, I'm trying to, to, to like put you in different groups so you can um, interact with the um, panelists and the moderators as much as possible. So, okay, let me see. Alan, I hope I'm not putting you on here twice uh this hermano rosemary you too i'm just gonna if i see a double name i'm just gonna put you both in the room all right and assume that um that all this copacetic let me see we need one more person here i'm gonna put lou in there some groups are a little bigger than others because we had to, we had to share the brains this you day. saw the one request in the chat what did it say it said uh yolanda was saying if she can go into the uh how we can unite uh various movements is the panel she'd like to participate in so uh, we're going to talk about that so look you guys have the option in your groups of either talking about all the questions because you have 20 minutes or you can just talk about the one question so choose wow. makes so sense you, any anyone you go to miha yolanda you, you can talk about those so um all right hopefully these groups are good i know some of these are glutted but they're not because there's repeaters and then um, i'll pass the questions around as well any any questions about how the breakout room go, go or 20 minutes and then we'll come back out to ask questions of our panelists. All right, here we go. Do you see? So some of you have to choose the, the option to go into the room. So if not, I'm going to try and move you. You should see a red button. There you go. Uh, Wardell 2, you're in room 6. Do you see that? OK, and let me try and make you. Uh, Put you in there again in case you didn't see it. Where are you? Walda, too, and then um, Walda, if I can get you in a room and Jack. I'm going to move you around again if you didn't see the option. So I'm going to put you in room two and then put you back in room one because room two has a lot of people. Jack, let's see if you can get in there. And Walda, I'm going to do the same thing with you in case you didn't join. Does it let you go in, Jack? All right, just wall this out. Okay, very good. Okay, here we are. Sorry, I'll just put it up. Um, Sorry, I want to hear. I want to hear what you got to say. Is that okay? Oh yeah. Quick, quickly. It's just you know the ways in which viruses and 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 um viral diseases like COVID 19 are are just the the fact of the matter is you know we could debate endlessly about the specifics of and the conspiracy theories but um biodiversity uh is being destroyed unquestionably on an on a massive scale around the world and the fact is is that a lot of viruses a lot of diseases um, exist uh, around the planet in uh, mostly in or largely in remote areas initially, remote parts of, 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 of un, uninhabited places, 
And as human, um, you know, production, expropriation gradually destroys those uh, vestiges of biodiversity, it creates pathways for those viruses um, to mutate and to evolve and to adapt and to come into contact with human beings or with human um, processes, human life, you know, livestock, farming. And so um, to that extent, I, I don't think it can be argued that COVID-19 is a result of uh, human destruction of the environment, um, climate change, you know, climate change is doing the same thing. Climate change is increasing the rate of biodiversity loss. So mm. I, I, I just want to want to want to say that I don't think we Joyce or I explicitly said that in our presentations, but it's it's an important um, piece. I and some, something else I learned from my students because I teach English one or two. <laughs> a lot of times I'm like, oh, this is fascinating. They were talking about how there's this possibility because the polar ice caps are melting that there might be old viruses that emerge that didn't have That's to emerge. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you can speak to that because that shit terrifies me to be quite honest, you know? And um, I, I don't, look, the other thing too is they were talking, about, I don't care where these viruses are coming from. What pisses me off is that the government isn't responding to make people healthy. They're prioritizing profit. The mm -hmm. fucking corporations get to say who they're gonna give the vaccine to and at what rate. And that to me is unconscionable, right? Because we can have all the theories about where the virus emerged. What I care about is how they didn't take care of us and why 500,000 people needlessly died under the watch of these MFers. You know what I'm saying? So thank you, my friend. I'm going to peace out, go back out mm -hmm. to the main room. Thank you for letting me record that excellent answer. You can see what the floating is like and everybody gets muted. 30 more seconds, I believe I am going to close the breakout rooms so everybody will come back out. Right on time. Welcome, welcome. Welcome back. Hello, hello, welcome, welcome back everybody. Welcome, welcome back. All right, so uh, originally we were going to have, can you hear, hear me okay? I'm not screaming, right, we're good. I actually just turn up my volume a little better. Um, we were going to have people respond, activists respond to the analyses that Joyce and Patrick put forth. And I'm not sure if anybody wants to respond. Um, uh, I know that Anastasia has been a speaker at one of our previous events, but you know, she doesn't have to, she doesn't want to. I, I had things I wanted to say, but I don't want to take the floor perpetually. So does somebody want to respond to the speakers and then we'll open up back to those questions that um, we distributed during the, the breakout rooms. Anybody? You can take stack. All right. Well, why don't we get started? Um, Tristan, you want to lead us off with question number one? And would it be helpful if I shared the questions or are you guys, are you guys gals, and others good? Do you want, thumbs up if you want me to share the questions? All right. So, sounds good. Are you sending a link or should I share my screen? I'm going to share my screen, Armando, so you oh. can focus on uh, doing your thing. All right. So, whenever you're ready. All right. So why does COVID apartheid exist? Why do we think this exists here? Let's see. Let's see. Somebody on stack. Anybody as speakers, you may you can also respond. Uh other other members, people who maybe haven't had a chance to speak a lot. Yeah, we spoke of uh uh, we spoke of the COVID uh, on a couple of levels. One, governmentally, i.e. the the fascist the President Trump, his, uh, his uh, dismissal of the meaning of COVID was one level. Mm. At the same time, many people 
were frightened of vaccinations, especially in the African-American community at the beginning because of the past, the vaccinations, which caused uh, uh, various changes in the bodily system of African-Americans in Tuskegee, for example. So it came from both parts, the apartheid. It came from the government and it came from also people who were frightened of, of the vaccination. That has changed, fortunately, because it should be understood by everyone that the vaccinations are the key to getting rid of the pandemic. There can be no question about that now. After 14 months, 15 months, we all have to recognize that. Okay. Thank you, comrade. Rita is on stack. Rita, do you want to ask your question or do you want to post it in the um, in the chat? And I forgot to mention, if you want to speak, please put stack in the chat. Um, be mindful of how much you're speaking. Keep it brief so everybody has a chance to go. Okay. Uh, and Lisa also raised her time. Very good. Rita, do you want to go ahead and start us off? Yeah, I, I just wanted to speak a little briefly about uh, the question of vaccine hesitancy, because I've spent a lot of time looking at this question. And what I've seen is vaccine hesitancy is ubiquitous for many, many different reasons. It's not just the, the reason of, say, the impact of Tuskegee syphilis experiment. And it's not just within the African-American community by a long shot, right. certainly not in the South. So I think, you know, we have to be kind of careful about that narrative. Um, there are also questions of access in rural parts of Georgia. There's almost virtually, it's very difficult to find uh, vaccine sites. So, you know, we need to, um, we need to kind of look at that um, a little bit. I also think that I think while it's true, and certainly as a retired registered nurse, I agree with getting vaccinated, no doubt. But the real question is broader than just vaccines. It really is about the development of a public health infrastructure that's rooted in a community that is trusted, right? And scientifically rigorous, um, as well as flush with whatever um, uh, uh, treatments, supplies, or what have you is needed. And that takes into account the whole person and the whole community, and not this idea of the isolation of the individual individual uh, within that. So I think, I think it's much broader. And I think we have to be careful of narratives that begin to look at, well, you know, uh, well, we have to look very broadly, uh, I think, at what our solutions are. And I think that's what, what probably one of the best things, if anything good has come out of this pandemic, is a growing awareness of the fractured nature of, uh, 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 of our healthcare system. Uh, I think Joyce spoke to this you know, brilliantly. There essentially is no public healthcare infrastructure. And I think Patrick talked about uh, you know, the uh, I believe it was the Cuban model as it related to agriculture. Well, that also applies to healthcare. <laughs> you know, it's it's far it's far advanced uh, in terms of a public health infrastructure that that we kind of need. So I just wanted to um, to to share uh, share some of those thoughts. Thank you, Rita. Uh, looks like we had up next was uh, Lisa. Uh, yeah, a little bit of what, what, what Jack said. He was in my group, so yes. Uh, but again, I think COVID just, we shine the light on COVID because of what was done for decades before, for centuries before. So we're seeing it happening in populations that have been marginalized and have been oppressed because they're too populated, right? Because maybe our culture says we live together multi-generations in the same space. If you go to the First Nations, right? They're living all together and you have the lack of water. Um, Rita, what you were saying, so I'm afraid, like you were saying about that narrative, let's not blame each other. We just see it and look more at the root of what brought us here because we can't solve it. We can solve this little piece, but it won't bring big change until we really solve the, the root. And Rita, you spoke of community and that brought me back to being a gay person in the 80s with the AIDS. Our country ignored it. And what, what did the gay community do? Is they did it themselves in community. There would be so many more deaths from HIV 
of all people, straight, gay, and of all colors, if the LGBT community did not say, screw you, we'll do it ourselves. And honestly, it brought gay and lesbians together because the gays knew how the PR, they knew the, the marketing part and the lesbians knew the community health and the community education part. So it actually healed our community within the community. Uh, so that's just an option of, of ways of thinking. So thank you, Rita, and thank you, Jack. Mm -hmm. Beautifully stated, Lisa. Thank you for sharing that perspective. Next, we had um, Anastasia. Hi, everyone. You know, it's amazing to me how <laughs> everything that comes out um, starts off in some other group. Is out, you know, we had HIV. It was the, the supposedly the gay white men who, you know, had that was HIV was prevalent with AIDS. And then it transitioned always into black men, black women. Now the black people, the most African-Americans have HIV and AIDS in America. Everything that happens and comes out, it starts off as one group, it ends with African-Americans. It started off with mostly elders, but it wasn't a race thing. Now, oh, African-Americans are more prevalent to now have COVID based on this system. I'm so tired of statistics, the media and everything else with all these different analogies. You know, and, and, and like you said, the narrative, the first thing everybody says, what, what's wrong with African Americans right now getting it? Most people I know have it. They have the, the vaccine. <laughs> they have gotten it and they're African American. I am choosing and have chosen not to get it, not because I'm afraid. I'm a very educated woman. One of my degrees is in science. It's, it's not because I'm afraid. It's not because of the Tuskegee or the uh, syphilis experiment. It's bigger than that. <laughs> you know, I do research, a lot of research. A lot of reading, and I don't just read what the media says, just what the paper says, just what Foxy says, um, because he's, oh, he's, the CDC says this. I've even went on the CDC sites before and looked up information that is not being broadcast publicly to get the true numbers of who has died, what they've gotten, you know, has affected everyone. So most people talk out of rhetoric based on what they heard or what they saw on the news or with someone who is so-called credible has said. So it's, ne it's never one, one narrative or one reason why people are not getting it or one reason why this is happening or one reason why there's so much violence in certain communities and neighborhoods because actually there's violence all over. But you, they'll make you believe that in my Bronzeville neighborhood that where I live at in Chicago, it is way more crime than any other areas because it's broadcast in the media. And it may be more crime based on a percentage of Blacks in the community and based on a, the, uh, the statistics, but there is white on white crime. There is, is, is uh, crime in every group, every race, every culture. There's crime, there's things that happen. Cool. It's just not broadcast. The deaths or the reasons and things like that. I know because I have family anywhere from <laughs> the very poor, to the very, very wealthy in my family, it go from here to all the way up there to the neurosurgeons and doctors and all that stuff. That uh, most of my family, my father's side, most of us have master degrees or PhDs, you know, so very well educated on paper, so to speak. You know, um, a lot of us have come from multiple family house homes where we, everyone hasn't um, been raised in single family households and even ones that have. Still, education and certain things were rooted in our, uh, our culture, our, our family, our, our community. And it depends on, like I said, each family. So it bothers me. It's, got, it's, it's not so much everyone's afraid. It's, kind of, it's actually kind of insulting when people want to put a narrative to what this is, what they're, they're, they're just afraid of getting with it. No, most people I know who are Black or African Americans get it. Most of my friends who don't have it are the ones who are more educated, researchers, scientists, doctors, uh, vegans, vegetarians, um, Hebrew Israelites, Muslims, people who have, it's, it, and it's not about necessarily religion either. It's because it's prescribed to a whole different type of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Where, and, and no one never talks about the food we're eating, except on here. Thank you for that. That presentation was awesome Thank you. <laughs> about yeah. agriculture. Yeah, yeah if like you don't mind, uh, Anastasia, if you don't mind starting to wind down so we can give other people I'm, time. I'm sorry. Speak. I apologize for my time. Um, but for the most part, no, there's not one reason 
or one so-called narrative. And if you talk to just one person, this African-American, they tell you why, that doesn't, that's not, that doesn't include all of us. Of Again, I do my own research and everyone has their own viewpoints. I just get tired of putting it in the box of what other people think the problem mm -hmm. is. And it's not what you think. It really isn't. Stop listening to the media, everything the media says, or so-called statistics, so those could be altered too. That's all I want to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sister. Appreciate you. And, you know, I got to say that um, I also came in with my own biases. If I could just take a few seconds. <laughs> and I was so angry because I was like, everybody needs to get vaccinated. This is how we're going to defeat the virus. First of all, that didn't shut down like they should have, like all these problems, right? So when I found out that leadership in my own local were not getting vaccinated, I'm talking chemists, biologists, some, some afraid for historical reasons, right? Different reasons. I was like, what? But people have various reasons why they're not getting vaccinated. They don't trust the corporations. They think the vaccine has come out too soon. So it's an issue. It's an issue I think we need to discuss, right? Um, and, and really get at the root at, you know, I, I, th I still think it's a good idea to get vaccinated. But then how are we going to keep the people safe that are not getting vaccinated? Because it's also about them. Um, anyway, so shall we continue on to the second question, my friend? We also had Goodman, I think was the last in the line. Goodman, there. Goodman, go ahead, yes. Mano. Okay, uh, I was going to say, I mean, this has been taken up by some of the other speakers, but in our group, we discussed uh, what I think is uh, one of the key problems, and that's that uh, we have a disgraceful uh, healthcare system nationwide, the U.S. being uh, probably the one of the very few, if not the only, Western countries that uh, does not have a single payer national uh, health care that's available to everyone. And the problem is we have to somehow get the insurance companies and the for-profit companies the heck uh, out of the health care market. I used to work in an insurance company, so I know firsthand just what we're dealing with and uh definitely they have to action has to be taken to cut out their role as middlemen okay thanks thank you so much for that thank you thank you on to question two uh once again you guys can in the chat uh just type stack if you want to participate in this uh question uh why is the environment being destroyed that is uh question number two so once again, type stack in the um, in the chat there. I can start with my own brief little opinion on it. I'm no great presenter, but um, at least to start the ball rolling on that one. Um, in our discussion room, we briefly spoke about um, with the environment being destroyed, you know, kind of leading back to Patrick, uh, Patrick's presentation, I think a lot of that has to do with the just capitalism as a whole, you know, we, we, it's a linear production. And I really like that, that diagram that he had where we, we just consume and we don't replenish, we don't replace, uh, it's not cyclic by any means. And, um, we definitely need to find a means to, to end that, uh, to reconnect that, to uh, close that circle. Um, in that regard. So at least I'll start with that. Hey, Sue. So one of the things that fascinates me about that Cuban project that Patrick was talking about, um, I mean, they haven't just national, they've nationalized the fossil fuel industry. People can take CT, like their version of CTA for free. Um, but what, what fascinates me about how Cuba produces its food is not only is it organic and based on the ecology of Cuba, but they grow their vegetables and fruits like practically in nature. So you want to talk about going back to the earth returning that is one of the most beautiful models i think i've ever seen i'm not in real life but in on video and through documentary i mean for for me even taking on that concept would be a revolutionary step if people would just grow things locally without having to use pesticides in a way that makes sense and um and not have to use you know, any number of pesticides that aren't even properly registered through the EPA or even enforced, you know? So I, I think that that to me is a beautiful model. And you see expressions of that here in Chicago. Um, there's a building on 47th, it's called the, um, the plant. And communities members come and support, you know, but they have organic produce. And this has been this building that's been converted into like this growing area 
you know, imagine what that would mean in terms of urban farming for people. People are food insecure everywhere, you know? So it's, it's a beautiful idea. Um, okay, somebody else wanna take it? Maybe we can popcorn it. You know how that goes? You pass it to somebody else and then if you don't wanna speak, you can pass or you can speak. So how about if I park, pop, I can speak English. Let's, let's popcorn it over to Lisbeth, who we haven't heard from. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, can you remind me which question that is you again? Betcha. The question is why, well, actually, you know what? I'm just gonna put it up again so we can oh, all yeah. see it because I forgot it. <laughs> the question is why is the environment being destroyed? Um, well, I, I don't know. I, I'm gonna answer this in a very obvious way, I think. Um, it, the environment is um, the fodder for capitalism. I mean, everything that's extracted from the earth is commodified. Um, and that's where, um, I mean, that's just what the, you know, that's how the earth is treated. It's, it's a resource that apparently they think is a bottomless pit. Um, and um, it's not, and, you know, and look at the length they're going to to drill for oil finding oil and it, it's um it's ridiculous we've got renewable resources everywhere but i think the um yeah i mean it's just somehow it, it got uh turned into like the primary resource for capitalism anything you want you have to dig it up or plant it or grow it or cut it down or you know um and push out the wildlife and you know and then wonder why you have you know animals coming and stealing babies you know and it's awful right so it's just a whole lack of um sensibility of the human um supremacy you know like we're here, it's ours. We're going to do with it what we want. Thank you, Elizabeth. Popping over to Lou. Here, there we go. Yeah, I, I think I want to just springboard from what Elizabeth was saying that um, capitalism is very short sighted. It can plan very well to how to make profits, but it has no sense or no interest really in planning anything else. It, uh, it doesn't plan for unintended consequences. That's, I think, the element of what Marx was talking about with the metabolic rift, that if you don't know how the metabolism works, you can't plan for it. And capital is only interested in what it can extract now. So consequently, digging deeply for and fracking and all that kind of stuff, why bother thinking about what consequences there are? It's not important. None of this stuff is important. Only extracting profit. And profit is here and now, and 20 years down the road, we might not be here anyway. So screw it. That's, I think, that's the mentality of capitalism. And that's why it destroys the environment. It cannot, literally cannot take care of the environment. It's not that it doesn't have the will to. It cannot take care of it. It's not in its genes. I'm done. Excellent. And then uh, I believe Rita was on stock. Is that right, Tristan? Uh, yep, Rita's next. Uh, uh, thank you, Lou. Th thanks, Tristan. Nice to nice to meet you on Zoom. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was just uh, just take off for a hot second on what Lou said. I mean, one of the things that. Uh, National Nurses United talked about very early in the pandemic was the notion of the precautionary principle, which is basically, you know, look before you leap, right? You know, know, know the implications of your actions um, before you actually engage in them. And this is particularly true 
uh, when we talk about the destruction of the environment for all the reasons Lou talked about. And I just, I mean, the capitalist really doesn't have a choice um, but to ex constantly expand in order to make his commodities um, more uh, cost effective for selling in the exchange market. So one of the things you see is corporate agriculture or, you know, just Walmart, take Walmart. How many little small businesses were wiped out when Walmart came into the corner? Because it was a big store, it had a lot of things and it could sell it a lot more, uh, uh, more cheaply and therefore drive the other capitalists, uh, big or small, out of business, right? It, it's, it is in the genes, it's in the essence, it's in the laws of, of, um, of capitalism itself. So, and I think, you know, to this, the question of corporate agriculture, um, you know, which, uh, you know, is horrific in terms of not, uh, not emphasizing what uh, Jesus, Jesus, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing your name right, Jesus is, was saying about how Cuba uh, actually, you know, grew, grows indigenous uh, uh, or, uh, foods and, and vegetables um, within the environment of, of, of nature, as opposed to stripping nature. Uh, and then, you know, we've witnessed this in the United States, the Dust Bowl, the contamination of water from these huge, you know, pig farms um, over and over and over again. And it doesn't have to be that way. I think this, the, you know, this question of for how we how we unite these movements to actually begin to share a unified vision of what's not only possible, but now necessary. Thank you. Brilliant words. Um, Rosemary. Uh, yeah, I was just going to throw in a couple of really examples because um, it, it's been presented so well, but I'm just thinking when I was first Working in Mexico, one third of the population was urban, two thirds are rural. Now it's completely reversed with people either going to the border here or Mexico City. Um, the, there are seed banks in Mexico to protect the corn because of the GMO corn coming in and ruining everything. And ironically, the International Seed Bank, which is in um, one of the Scandinavian countries to save seed from all over the world is being flooded because of global warming. Mm. And secondly, um, there's a whole movement in California, a lot of people about teaching outside during the, um, the 1918 uh, flu epidemic. They even had uh, open air schools in Rhode Island in the winter, they found ways to do it. And the studies show that the kids, like in the forest school movement in uh, Germany at that time, kids do much better when they're outside part of the time. They did better academically than the kids that weren't. Um, I was just on an international conference with teachers from five countries and one teacher was pointing out he teaches three days a week in the classroom and he takes the kids out for two days to do whatever the hell they want outside. He calls it quote field work. And um, um, Indian and Korean farmers, that's another point. They have, there's like hundred thousand, several hundred thousand who have committed suicide in both countries because with Monsanto, you now have to buy the seeds. The seeds won't grow unless you have the fertilizer. The farmers can't pay for it. So they commit suicide. And when I was at the WTO protest in, in, Yucatan, in Cancun in uh, 2003, one of the the president of the Korean farmers committed suicide on the barricades when we were there as a protest. And finally, with the um, uh, Cuba, they are so refined it that they have vermiculture where they have uh, developed different kinds of worms that can put different kinds of minerals and even vitamins into the soil. They have so refined the natural process. So you can use certain forms worms for this field for another one. So it, it is possible. And that's the way we have to go. And, you know, I mean, even our DNA is being sold. And there's a little meme you see on uh, Facebook it shows a picture of trees and says this tree, they have no value unless, to ca unless they can be sold, which was capitalism. And it shows a picture of a forest. So it's out there, but these are just little examples um, I'm kind of visual and I kind of think by association, but just the whole process that's going on. 
Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, and so Tristan, I'm just going to take a, the, a, we're going to do one more on this question and because we have about 16 minutes left and we want to give time to talk about the question of unity, which is so key. So Sarah, one more about this issue and the environment. I, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, what Lou said and a couple of other people said about just the, how the system of capitalism works. It's if corporations don't, don't maximize their profits, if they don't squeeze profit out of everything, whether they're corporations that deliver health care, supposedly, or whatever they are, they're going to go under, they're going to cease to exist. And, and one that's, that's willing to do whatever it needs to do, right? Not, not to deliver what people need, but to make profit. They're, they're going to, it's going to survive. And I think when people say, why can't they, why can't they house people? Why can't we have universal health care? Why, why is public health being defunded? Then we have to talk about the private property system of capitalism or whatever comes after it. And, and of course, people don't understand that because they're, they're reasonable. They reasonably think that these things are, exist for human need and good, you know? Um, so I just wanted to, to sort of underline that and that we need to be able to write, um, clarify that in the context of all these life and death questions. And certainly with the COVID, this is so much on the table. And why, why did we have so many people die unnecessarily in this country, in this advanced country? You know, it is the private property system and, and that's not an abstraction. That's just the way the thing works. And that until that gets changed, you know, we're, we're, our people are gonna die. So yeah, we all understand that. But, but people, people aren't taught. It's not their, uh, not their fault that they don't understand that. Nobody, nobody explains it, right? So, so that's, that's really the job of people who do understand it. And that doesn't make us smarter. That means somebody taught us. That's all. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I was just going to move on to the third and maybe fourth question simultaneously. So I'll share my screen since I have the power. Um, all right. So you guys can all see that. Uh, so third question is, what is the intersectionality among these events? Um, I guess comparing um, COVID apartheid, like why it exists, as well as the destruction of our environment. Uh, example, how these issues interrelate and follow up, because we do want to touch on unity as we have uh, about 13 minutes. Uh, how can we unite our various movements so we can strengthen each other uh, onto victory? So let me just unshare that real quick. I saw Steve was uh, in the stack. I don't he know if it was for He just canceled the... himself. Oh, okay. I mean, that came out wrong, but he canceled. Yeah. Uh, all right, excellent. Tristan, beautiful job moderating. Anybody else want to speak on this issue? I'm especially interested in the concept of unity and how we can come together to support one another. So I see Anastasia, I know she's spoken, but if no one else is, has anything to share, we'll... Uh... Call on Joyce, she, she hasn't spoken since yeah. she presented. If you don't mind, Anastasia, I'll put you after Joyce, if that's cool. Yeah, um, I think, you know, this is the question that we're all living with all the time. I wanted to really get back to some of the things that um, Anastasia and... Um, and so, and other people talked about, because I think, you know, um, in this room, obviously this virtual room, we've got like so much experience um, that it's really exciting. Um, I was a AIDS case manager for many years with um, people who are quote unquote, triple diagnosed, meaning they were mentally ill, quote unquote, and, um, were homeless and 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 had some kind of addictions as well as AIDS. And this was before retrovirals, before we had retrovirals. And I learned a lot 
from my patients because, you know, they were dealing, this was a time when, you know, you really had very few choices. It's sort of like before we had the vaccine, um, they had to figure out how they were going to live in a, in a, in an environment where the even the medications that people were getting were really kind of nuclear <laughs> medications, um, you know, for cancers and for um, you know something like we're seeing in India now the the opportunistic infections that people got with this illness, uh, the black fungus is what they are talking about in India, and and we're look, we're, we're going to see the same thing here, right? What is opportunistic? We, we think that the virus is opportunistic, but it's the society that's opportunistic on this process fundamentally. And we haven't really gotten to, the, I mean, the, the, the big advantage I would say about this question of unity is that in the times that we're talking about previously, like particularly with HIV AIDS, it was, a section of society that felt that it was under attack first and then a broader section and then it disappeared into as people are saying into those that you know were the furthest out and most vulnerable but this the the advantage about this covid thing is that even though it's totally socially unequal how people suffer from it it is something that is showing the global nature of our connections. And I think that this question of unity has to come down to a recognition that objectively, we have the same interests at some level to accomplish what we need to accomplish. There's nothing that we can do to get all of us thinking the same way. There's not, there's not one answer to what you do with the a vaccine. There's not one answer to how you protect yourself in a family where everybody has to work. There's, there is no one answer. People have to do the best they can do with their brains to figure out how to survive because we don't have a system that can really deal with the fundamental issues. And we know that. So I would just say on this question of unity, we have to consider, we, we know some things about dealing with community. People have learned, like people are saying, we've got examples from Cuba or from Kerala, India, or from any of these uh, quote unquote socialist communist countries or whatever. We've got community work that we've done for you know so long. We've got plenty of opportunities People are really thinking and doing and putting open source thinking out there. What we don't have is our hands on the levers of our society. We have got to, and not just in our communities, not just locally, because this we are a global economy and we are a global society at a certain level. And it isn't too big. We've got to convince ourselves it's not too big because we have to do it now. We have no, this is my contestant, is, is that the, this transformation has to go on now in order for humanity to survive. It's not the end of times, it's now. And if we do it now, we have an opportunity to survive together. And somehow we revolutionaries and the people in this room are very well equipped, it sounds to me, really uh, have to find the ways to get our folk into a position where we treat this mutual support in a way that allows us to get our hands on the levers. Beautifully said, excellent. Um, I just had to chime in because we have been talking about this, the, 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 it was in another meeting, the impulse of people to help each other and cooperate, that's what's human. Not this division, not hating you because you're black, hating somebody because they're a lesbian, you know, whatever. Um, and it moves me to see, like for example, Anastasia is part of a parent union goes beyond the labor unions and I'm, I'm in labor, but these unions where people are uniting to meet each other's needs because the government won't, that is a beautiful expression, not a solution, but a beautiful expression of people coming together, you know? Look like it was Anastasia next. Yeah, thank you for that, um, Jesus. And also Joyce, that was right on the money. You're right, there's not one solution um, because there's not one problem and there's not one point of origin. 
there's many. Um, I think we all have offended each other. We have all have done something to contribute, you know, to all of this. There's no one that's completely innocent. No one's completely guilty. So once we admit that, yeah, there's been a lot of false information, there's been traditions that's been passed on down to our families that are false, that we found out later as we get older, like, my God, I was taught this way. And then there's something totally different. So we are a sum of all of our experiences, um, our, our environments, our education, um, you know, our personal beliefs, as well as also any type of religious or higher power beliefs. And we all come from different backgrounds, you know, in different families. And every family has their own issues. <laughs> you know, we all know that. Uh, there's no so-called perfect family, um, no matter what, um, what class you're in financially, uh, what have you. Um, there's no one, no perfect family. And, and there's a lot of systems. So in order for us to come together, the word unifying has been spread around all day long. How do we unify this group? How do we unify us? How do we all come together? And the truth is that it's not something that we just started doing. It's been, we've been working on this for many years. You know, there's been decades and, and all of our ancestors have been working on this, you know, breaking systems, um, fighting the so-called 1% in capitalism. We've all been working on this for a long time. So now do the COVID, down, now do the other things that's happened. I do agree, this is a great opportunity for us to figure out what's important, what, what's important. And, and uh, just to wrap everything up, I just want to just say, you know, when it all boils down to it, it takes each of us. If it's, even if it's 10 of us on this phone call and we're the ones who are working on one specific area or what have you, it doesn't, you know, if it only takes 10, to help influence the masses, so be it. <laughs> we don't, we, we, everyone is not going to come with us. And once we just realize that what we do every day individually is what's going to make the change. You know, we, we and I'm quoting Obama, <laughs> you know, be, us being the change individually is what's part of it. And just recognizing it and being honest with the fact that there are systems that are much harder to change than, than others. Some, some things are just, built into the what this country is. It's, it's built from the beginning. So um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. And it's, Anastasia, it's always a pleasure to see you. You're always welcome back, you know, uh, to participate, to help plan. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would love, love to have you on. So wonderful to see you. Thanks, you too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I agree. All right, we got, uh, this is a super lightning round. Three minutes for Lisa, then Lou, and maybe Rosemary. <laughs> maybe. Uh, so what you, Joyce and, and Anastasia said, it reminded me, I believe it's a quote from Rumi. It says, you are not a single drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a single drop. And that is our power. So what I work with is dialogue. I work like this, this university I just came from, 46 different countries, all dealing with COVID at the same time because we were in the middle of it. And when we had a dialogue together, we saw how similar we are to each other. So to have that courage to sit down even with your enemy. You cannot solve if all you do is hate your enemy. You have to sit down, you have to understand the context. As Anastasia says, all of us have our own issues in our families, right? Uh, so if we don't understand that we can't move forward together. Otherwise, we're just going to be at war where we, uh, we win over the other side and then we wait for the day when they get us back. So how do we move forward together? For me, it's, it's dialogue and it's love and it's teaching at home, empathy to your children. Right, because they have it from the day they were born, and they unlearn it because of the things they see us say and do, and that's what I got to say. Beautiful, I agree. As a mother of, well, I'm sure Tristan will too. That's so wonderful and fundamental. You know, he's got three kids, but my kids are 11 and, and uh, six, and uh, that's been one of the things that is so important to raise good human beings that are empathetic. I care more about the empathy than the intellectual development, to be honest. Um, all right, so. So uh, who's up next? Real quick, lightning round. Was it Lou? Lou, 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 Lou. Lou, you can me. do it. You can do it, Lou. I'll try. Uh, first of all, I want to I want to express my thanks to everybody who's spoken so far. It's really been a delight and a learning experience for me. I've, I've very much enjoyed the the last few comments with Lisa and Anastasia, 
Uh, and we spent in our small group uh, a, a, all our time talking about the fourth question. So we're, that's something that, that I, I feel very strongly about. Um, we are in a different place today than we were a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. We're a totally different place. We're looking at a, you know, we're not looking at going back to where we were before. We're looking at going forward to what's new and what's possible. That's what's really key. And this is not a time for small ideas. This is the time for big ideas, for thinking with other people about what those big ideas might be. Uh, and, and I think uh, whoever it was said, we don't have the solutions. I agree. I mean, we have, <clears throat> we have something about the, the pathway, an understanding about the pathway toward a cooperative society. But how we get there, we are going to be deciding that, not just the people in this room, but by listening to other revolutionaries that are out there doing similar kinds of things, that's what's going to pull us together. And I'm going to finish <clears throat> my little comment with an excerpt from a poem by, by uh, Gwendolyn Brooks that I mentioned in our, our breakout room. It's from a larger poem called Winnie. And she, and she writes in the, in the voice of Winnie Mandela, my poem is life and not finished. It shall never be finished. My poem is life and can grow. Wherever life can grow, it will. It will sprout out and do the best it can. I give you what I have. You don't get all your questions answered in this world. How many answers shall be found in the developing world of my poem? I don't know. Nevertheless, I put my poem, which is my life, into your hands, where it will do the best it can. I am not a tight-faced poet. I am tired of little tight-faced poets sitting down to shape perfect, unimportant pieces poems that cough lightly, catch back a sneeze. This is the time for big poems, roaring up out of sleaze, poems from ice, from vomit, from tainted blood. This is the time for stiff or viscous poems, big and big, and I'm done. Damn, what a way to wrap up. Um, Alyssa, does anybody have a parting shot? People who haven't spoken. I know that um, our sister- Rosemary was on stage. Rosemary? Yeah. yeah, she was, she was. Rosemary, and maybe one more parting shot. Yeah, what an act to follow. That's such a great summary. I was just gonna make the point of, about Fidel, um, having heard him give a five hour incredible speech and also the book, 100 hours of interviews with him. You know, it's, he never said, he says, you know, we're not perfect. We have these different tendencies, but everything is education and everything he talks about through these interviews and his, and his speeches is always education, education. So it's dialogue to me, listening, empathy and educating and co-educating together. And beautiful, that's beautiful. beautiful. Thank you, thank you. I just wanted to invite Amy or people who haven't gotten a chance to speak. Would anybody like to share anything else? No, all right. She's agreeing with everything we said. Well, welcome to the league, Amy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so that's actually not a bad segue. Patrick, Armando, if you could just take us home. And then we're going to end with this beautiful poem by uh, one of our comrades, Michelle Soturos. Oh my gosh, such a moving piece. But go ahead, Patrick. Hey everyone, um, I'm just going to give a quick pitch or uh, summary of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. I'm just dropping in the chat right now a link to our program. Um, oh wait, no, that was just Hazu. One sec. That is the program uh, in the chat of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America um, to join. The league is to read and uh, accept the program. Um, the, the league is a completely grassroots organization um, devoted to uh, providing education and a framework of struggle for revolutionaries. 
um, yeah, uh, we are, um, you know, in most places in the country, but we are, are looking to expand and obviously uh, meet other revolutionaries. So please reach out to us. Um, yeah, we'd love to talk um, and get to know you. Um, we, we use the Rally Comrades as a publication um, and it provides up-to-date articles and statements of the key questions of importance to the class. Um, we encourage you to check out the Rally Comrades and we invite you to join us in the struggle for change and revolution um, and to unite uh, around the basic needs and study and learn from one another and realize the vision to secure the future of humanity and our planet. So check us out at learna.org and uh, we're at the Learna Chicago Facebook page. Thank you, thank you all so much for coming. It's solidarity forever. Preach, brother. Hey, if you don't mind pasting that URL, that'd be fantastic. So uh, you can also follow us on Twitter and I'll be posting the handle. So this again is a poem by Michelle Soltoros and she, um, she messaged me the five days before, I think it's what it's called. I'm gonna have to change the title because she never mentioned that. Originally, this was performed at another event, um, the Red Carnation Poetry, which I have to give a huge shout out to our comrade Jack Hirschman um, for celebrating that, again, an anti-fascist movement based on poetry, which was so beautifully explained. But this is uh, Michelle Soltoro. She's going to explain a little bit about the background. Just gorgeous. I know I've talked it up a lot, but it's just amazing. Actually, you know what? I'm going to reshare. I made a tactical error. Always push the shared sound button, comrades. Always, always. <laughs> It took me a long time to figure that one out. I'll tell you what. Okay, here we go. Play. Let me know if you can hear it okay. Thank you for inviting me. I am Michelle Salteris. I'm a first generation Greek American slam poet from Chicago, Illinois, but right now I am in Aurora, Colorado. Um, the anti fascist poem that I've chosen to share today because we all have more than one, right? <laughs> um, is personal, I guess. It's personal to my family and personal to my people. So a little background on uh, the story, I guess, is on October 28th, 1940, the Italian dictator Mussolini gave Greece an ultimatum that we could give up our harbors and let them occupy Greece, or we could go to war. And our prime minister, Ionis Metaxas, replied with, then it is war. And the message spread all through Greece, Ochi, which means no, and everyone kind of expected Greece to lose, but they actually beat the Italians so bad that they needed to call the Nazis for backup, which threw off their plans and kind of gave the allies hope again. So I wrote this poem five days before Trump was elected when he quoted Mussolini mm -hmm. and said that it didn't matter who said it because it was a good quote. October 28th, 1940, Greece says, Oh, he. No. To the Italian dictator stationing soldiers on their land, knowing they probably can't fight off the consequences of their choice. 1940, my grandmother is five. She is walking to school with people hanging from the trees. 1940, there are people in line for a loaf of bread they know will not feed their family for the week. 1940, Greek soldiers line up to fight a war they know they are not big enough to win. 1940, Churchill says Greeks do not fight like heroes. Heroes fight like Greeks. 1941, America joins war for financial gain. 1941, America fights in a war they will never actually see. 1941, American president, American people, halfway across the world from it says yes and never cares what it looks like. 1941, America says yes. Yes, atom bomb. Yes, fighter jets. Yes, big market for big gain. 1941 America will never see 1941 Greece. 2016 America will never Google search 1941 Greece. Still don't see the wars they fight. Still can't find the right reasons. 2016 America, I am listening to him speak. And sometimes he almost quotes him. Sometimes 
he looks like him. They call him Donald and I call him 1930 Mussolini gaining friends and I watch America say yes again. 1940s, the Archbishop of Greece says we must stand with our Jewish brothers. 2016, and I'll be damned if I do not stand with my Muslim ones. This is for an America that puts a man like this on a pedestal. This is for an America that sees no problem in a man who wants to hand out nuclear weapons like candy on Halloween, and a man who hates based on religion, based on sexuality, gender, race. This is for an America that doesn't know how to fight like heroes, let alone Greeks. This is for the Americans who fight like Trumans or Jacksons or Davises. This is for the Americans who flaunt the Confederate flag, who want to make America great again, like there's a time they could go back to. This is for America like a wake up call, like the second alarm you set just in case you slept through the first one. This is before you have religion ID cards. This is before people are hanging in your, your trees. This is before you forget to say no, to say no, say no. Thank you. Woo! Damn, that was amazing. So uh, thank you again, everybody for joining. Lou, if you wanna close this out and maybe offer the uh, invitation to our future events, which are going to be even more rad. And then just on a personal subjective note, let's all give Tristan a huge round of applause because he stepped in and stepped up. And thank you for doing such a brilliant job. And thank you to Mary Beth's wife for being a co-amazing partner and just all the wonderful things you can imagine in a couple they embodied that so thank you for both for being wonderful participating and uh um, just wanted to invite any of you who are interested not just to join the league but you can also join the committee and help us plan events so here's some examples of what we collectivized yeah welcome everybody's welcome message lou or we could just email that out go ahead lou uh, just a couple things to keep you on on for a minute or two next week uh next saturday on june 5th, uh, there will be the second in a series at this point of three defund, abolish, reconstruct uh, <clears throat> uh, webinars that the league is putting on. This is a national dialogue. We're not doing that in Chicago, but it's being done uh, nationally. And um, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you will find if you go to the league website lrna.org you will see a way to register for that uh, so please do that it's next week the last saturday of every month is the chicago dialogues or chicago political conversations date and the last saturday in june is june 26th and we are talking about now doing a follow-up on our housing event that we did before so we're going to do that and it will be connected to the very fact that June 19th, a week earlier, was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, was June, Juneteenth. So it will be a special event dealing with that. And there are future events uh, dealing with education and with poetry. And we hope to have you all back again for those events. Look forward to it. It's been a wonderful day. Thank you all for, for, uh, coming by and we'll see you next time happy more of the weekend everybody be safe god bless you all all right very good Thank you everybody for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our Learner Rally YouTube channel.